Hello, I'm Dr. Elliot Antman, President of the American Heart Association here for AHA Science News in Chicago. The theme of this year's scientific sessions was big data. I actually touched on that in my presidential address, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. But joining me to discuss the whole topic of big data is uh, Professor Lars Valentin from Uppsala, Sweden, who's uh, our Paul Dudley White International Lecturer, and Dr. Mikhail Kosoborod from Kansas City, who's the co-chair for our Global Congress embedded within scientific sessions on big data. Uh, I uh, talked about the need for disruptive innovation to improve the way we provide therapeutic options for our patients. It's simply taking too long to discover things that are going to be helpful for patients. And we're immersed in a new era now where we have digital tools and technologies that were not available to us previously. And these enable us not only to take care of patients in different ways, but actually to do research in different ways. I showed a very simple example. We uh, had Dr. Paul Dudley White's original ECG machine that he used in his office decades ago, and it was state of the art at that time, but it was a single channel ECG machine. And I showed, uh, by contrast, what we have available today, where you could hold a, a case that fits on the back of a smartphone, and you can record a lead one rhythm strip anywhere in the world uh, as the patient, so you don't have to be connected to the machine. That's just a very simple example of all the tools and, tools and technologies that uh, we have available. The American Heart Association has launched the Cardiovascular Genome Phenome Study, uh, which is a very uh, innovative research platform to provide genomic and phenomic data on patients from well-described cohorts. And Lars, you have worked so long in Sweden to build uh, very well-described registries, and more recently, you've done what nobody else has actually started to do successfully, which is to actually embed randomization in those registries. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, your registries in Sweden and how you were able to actually get the randomization going? I mean, the, the registries in Sweden were really built to promote health care and to equalize the quality of care in the whole country. So we were able really to have registries in every patient admitted for coronary artery disease, either acute or chronic, and also in heart failure and in other areas. So we all admissions, we record data, not only in the electronic patient records, but variables. And we have around between 200 and even up to 500 patients, <coughs> sorry, 200 to 500 variables entered for patients on admission and during follow-up while in hospital. So therefore, we know for every patient the characteristics, we know the diagnostics, we know the treatments provided, we know the procedures, and in Sweden we have the unique facility that we can track these patients for life, because in Sweden every person has a personal number from birth, and we are allowed to merge the data with the public registries on readmission to hospitals, on also <coughs> prescription of medications and also concerning death. And therefore we can track every patient from the first admission until death. And we know every follow-up <coughs> manifestation of the disease and treatment. And by registering this in order to promote health, in order to improve quality, the personnel is interested in entering the data. So we have acceptance from all hospitals to enter the data, and we can then integrate research into this. We can do outcome research and try to understand what is the effect of different kinds of treatments in the real world environment. And, and this has been a great tool to evaluate new treatments and their efficacy in the reality. But what we thought was that this is not the top grade evidence if you like to evaluate new treatment strategies, and then you need to randomize. So what we was <coughs> doing, we developed a system for embedding prospective randomized trials into the registries. Mm -hmm. So for a patient, for example, entering with a PCI, we enter the baseline characteristics and eventually some coronary angiography data, and then the system tells <coughs> the interventionalist, this is a patient suitable for the trial. Would you consider to randomize him? And if so, there comes up a form for informed consent and the patient is randomized. And then the system takes care of complete follow-up. 
and by that we can really recruit into <coughs> some of these trials not five to ten percent of patients as usual in <coughs> clinical trials but rather 60 70 percent of the eligible population and come up with very cost-effective prospective clinical trials of new treatment strategies in the system so you and your team are really a, a world leader in this approach, and congratulations on the success you've had with that. Mikhail, we, we've talked about these things, and we've also discussed the fact that we're going to have to train a, a new generation in thinking differently. No longer will it just be the frequentist classical approach, which we're very familiar with. And you designed a global congress focusing on big data. Could you tell us a little bit about the plans that you had for that meeting and, uh, and what you've actually accomplished? Yes, no. so it was very exciting to actually plan the Global Congress and the big data is such a big theme at this conference and I think it's so far it's been going uh, wonderfully well. Uh, and uh, I guess, uh, you know, the idea, we of course are an international meeting uh, and so we have different perspectives, but in the United States uh, we have of course a lot of challenges because we don't have, as far as uh, combining different data sets or accumulating big data in a way that's been done in Sweden. So guess one of the theme was, what do you do if you don't live in Sweden? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, there were multiple perspectives. I think oh, yesterday's opening session for the Global Congress was a perfect example of both highlighting the promise of what could be accomplished with big, big data, big science, uh, and also some of the real challenges that we face because uh, I think, you know, in Sweden, this has been a process that's been going on for a long, long time and it's been perfected over time. Uh, you know, we are developing new systems uh, to try to get there here in the U.S. And, and of course, there are going to be some growing pains associated with that. So one of the challenges that you just pointed out uh, is the fact that we don't have uh, uh, nearly as many people as we need uh, to actually be data scientists in this country. Yes. Uh, so if we're going to have this large uh, uh, depositories of data, uh, who's going to do a good job to make sure that the data gets analyzed appropriately in a methodologically rigorous and sound way? Uh, in fact, uh, Dr. Califf yesterday brought up the point that uh, one of the lay magazines called the data scientists uh, the sexiest job available today because, and I, I'm not quite sure how they determined that, <laughs> but I guess one of the things um, that he pointed out is that we only have one person available for five uh, possible jobs uh, in that field. So there's a huge deficit of that and hopefully one of the things that we'll be able to overcome over time is actually training this new generation of data scientists. And then of course there are issues with uh, governance and access to data, a lot of it's proprietary. Uh, how do you democratize access to it? Um, there are issues with ethics, and so there are lots of challenges, not a lack of challenges, but uh, I think there is a huge promise as well. So, Lars, you must have thought about these things. Let's just start with the curriculum for training people about how to do big data research, how to actually get the data scientists of the future up to speed and do no, what we uh, need them to do. What did you do in Sweden? No, I, I think we absolutely have the same deficit in analyzing the data. So we have a wealth of data, but we have much too few bioinformatics people and statistics people and also well-trained uh, scientists to do this. So therefore, it, I, I think we have even a larger problem than you have. We have a small population. It's hard mm -hmm. to recruit these people. So we have uh, small groups working on this. It is, of course, uh, distributed throughout the country because, I mean, the ownership of this registry is <coughs> national and therefore all universities can do research in the system. But what we now are adding to the system is, of course, also to biobank blood samples, serum mm -hmm. samples, and we are adding on genomics, we are adding on proteomics. Just now, uh, in, Swe in Sweden, we concluded the research project on the human protein atlas. Mm -hmm. So we have now outlined 20,000 proteins, and there is antibodies available against 20,000 proteins. So you have the genomics, the proteomics, you accumulate <laughs> samples from the patients, and to try to understand these complexities mm -hmm. and which biomarkers should be used. And I mean, with the goal to personalize treatment, to come up with decision support tools by analyzing proteins or eventually genetics and try to tailor treatments to the individual patients supported by the system. And then translate that into a learning experience where the system can learn from itself over time. I mean, so that, that's a dream, isn't it? It is the dream, the continuously updated learning system yeah. so that we can actually feed data into it and it can talk back to us. You know, one of the things that I've been thinking about quite a bit is how we deal with the fact that 
individuals who are contributing data through their hard work as scientists to a system like this want to have the opportunity to write up their results, their findings. But we're also cognizant of the fact that we want to contribute to the community good by actually providing this data so that everybody can start to look at it. And we've come up with the idea that we want to consider a window of time for individuals who are the scientists, the original scientists doing the, the basic research or the fundamental research that was added into the system. How much time do you think we ought to allow them to write up their findings before we say it really is posted and open to the world? Any thoughts on that, Michael? Well, I mean, I think it's uh, very reasonable. Y you know, the themes that clearly emerged, uh, I think, yesterday again in the opening session is that uh, in order for this to work well, uh, ideally there should be more of a democratic system, uh, you know, again, these issues with access to data, who has it, who has the prerogative to analyze it. But at the same time, you have to be cognizant of the fact that it takes a huge amount of work to put it together, it takes a huge amount of work to make sure it's um, operational and, uh, you know, rigorously cleaned and prepared for analysis. So, you know, what exact period of time, it's hard to tell, but I think, it, you, you know, to put a you know, point, uh, time point on it, I think somewhere in the neighborhood of, you know, maybe a couple of years, you know, it, it does take time, obviously, to do the analysis that you need to do and write it up and present it. So, you know, uh, it, it should not be unreasonably long, but the people who actually put in the hard work uh, should obviously uh, have some benefit mm -hmm. of uh, and recognition for what they did. And what have you done about data sharing and this, this window of opportunity uh. for the original investigators? Yeah, I think, I mean, this is a national system, it is publicly funded, <laughs> and, and therefore it needs to be open to all, all participants, so they can come up with questions, but not necessarily get the full database. They can get a subset of the database, mm -hmm. but we need to certify that they have uh, the necessary expertise to do the analysis and the experience of doing outcome research. I mean, you might come up with any answer from a registry, as you know, and even a randomized tri trial can be misused. So I, I think the important <coughs> factor might not be that you get the data, it is that you can put up, come up with your own questions and the system should have the resources to analyze that together with you. It is not that you hold your data in, data in your own hand, it is that you can raise whatever question and get that answered probably by more than one center. Probably we should have a few different data centers that can yeah. do the appropriate analysis. That's how it's done at least today in Sweden. So we have some very big responsibilities here. Uh, one is to make sure that we get uh, correct uh, answers to the healthcare community because if there are incorrect analyses or flawed analyses, we could actually create harm here by Absolutely. actually having the wrong information put out there. But, uh, and also, on the other hand, our patients are asking for this to happen faster. So we really need to pay attention to this quite uh, uh, quickly. And that's why I'm so glad that you organized the Global Congress on, on Big Data. And I know you had participants coming from different parts of the world. Can you tell us uh, who, was, who was there from different parts of the world and what kind of conversations were going on so far? Yeah, so, you know, there was, again, wide representation. And uh, I think uh, the opening session, uh, again, yesterday morning, and there was an, a very nice ethics session today about the governance and ethics of big data and patient participation. So we actually had patient advocates, uh, patient advocates presenting as well, a patient perspective on data sharing. And I think the picture that's emerging is, again, it is an international pro problem. You know, we uh, are probably, you know, the time is ripe right now in this country, uh, as well as many other uh, parts of the world, to really get this right. Uh, and it seems like the barriers are clearly not on the patient side. The patient uh, perspective was clearly that this is the right thing for them. Mm -hmm. And while there is a small proportion of patients that may have some concerns about privacy, there is an overwhelming concern to make sure we generate the data that is necessary to mm -hmm. improve people's lives. So I think that's clearly the number one purpose that we have. Uh, so the uh, other big theme, very similar to what you just mentioned, Elliot, is uh, getting the answers that are correct answers, but getting them uh, faster and you know, in a better way faster and at a lower cost than what we used to. And so, you know, we clearly have the computing power, we have the infrastructure, and just putting the pieces together. One uh, example of how it can be put together uh, successfully was actually the Milan Veterans Project, which is yes. probably as close as, uh, you know, Sweden as it gets in the United States as far as having an integrated health system uh, with one medical record. And uh, while there are still challenges, uh, you know, they pursued a very similar approach in many ways to what you did with the Swedish National Registers, uh, which is having uh, a, um, you know, 
core structures, you know, very, very well-developed structures for how data is cleaned and organized and who actually analyzes it and make sure that people who analyze it have the credentials to do so. And probably the population was as large as Sweden. So therefore, I mean, Sweden is a small country and, and your healthcare system might be as big as the whole country of Sweden. One of, my, one of my dreams, my goals as president uh, this year uh, for the American Heart Association is f to have everyone uh, appreciate the interconnectedness of all the various things we're doing. And that's why uh, I was so pleased when we were able to plan the Paul Dudley White International Session where we have some of our basic scientists talking about some very cutting edge basic research all the way up to uh, very modern uh, population level research that uh, you'll be discussing. And I know the global congress that you've organized also has representatives from all the major domains in Absolutely. the research community, which is going to be so important for us. Well, Lars, thank you very much for making the journey uh, from uh, Sweden, and we're very much looking forward to hearing your lecture. And Mikhail, uh, thank you to you and your team for putting together the Global Congress. Uh, it's been a great success so far, I'm sure. And we're going to have many, many more conversations about big data. This is just the start. So this is Elliot Antman for AHA Science News.